is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the Immortal Great Souls series, book one, Bastion. Chapters 31 through, was it 34, I believe? Yes, in these chapters, we find out that I was thinking there would just be mana to harvest in this derelict, abandoned academy. But it turns out there is a whole ass gauntlet. That's handy. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Dan for commissioning this episode. Um, I just really have been enjoying this book so much, Dan. It's been delightful. It's uh, th- There's definitely periods of, a, of it feeling like, at times, sort of video gamey. At times, there's a feeling that's like, it's similar to Cradle just because of how the magical system is set up. But it is different and new enough of an overarching plot that it still feels like interesting and not too derivative. And I'm just having a good time. It's, it's just been nice. So let's get things started out of the gate. 31, our friends go into this, this abandoned Academy. And the last sentence of the previous chapter was Scorio singing, saying, let's see what treasures may have been forgotten and await us within. And what I really enjoy about this is like, you know, one time Scorio managed to stumble across a dead body that had some really dope tools that he was able to use to his advantage that really saved his life repeatedly at this point. However, despite that having happened one time, it's very clear that this author is not just going to be giving out toys anymore. The author was like, okay, he doesn't have access to the usual shit that he would need for his magic. And, you know, when I was talking earlier about this reminding me of Cradle, I just really want to say, like, I'm not trying to imply that this author is, is stealing shit from Cradle so much as I have grown to understand that Cradle was stealing shit from, like, many other established properties that I'm not that familiar with and that there's like a lot of sort of anime tropes as well built into this. And so when I compare it to Cradle, it's simply because that's my personal frame of reference, but not because I'm saying that they're actually really related at all. But the comparison I want to make here is the way that Lyndon had to cheat his way through to getting to the point where anybody would train him because he didn't have any access to magical ability. And so he had to use props and tools and plan ahead and set traps and basically, you know, do everything he could to get a leg up because everything that was acceptable to do was out of reach for him utterly. Um, So I really this this whole like vibe here of him finding these tools initially before he is able to even like ignite his heart and access his ability it makes a lot of sense um it's still slightly different because he's actually still using his magical ability to power them which is like quite an accomplishment whereas linden he didn't even really have that to work with. You know, he was able to use scripts and that was like the extent of it. So I just think it's really fun that we get to this, like, and and when I say fun, I actually mean the opposite of fun, but not in terms of my experience as a reader more. It's the opposite of fun for our characters where the, the gift that they get coming through to this abandoned area is not, huge stores of mana. It's not relics of objects and, you know, recipe books on how to make them. It's work. Our gift is being able to be killed a lot. I mean, 
I guess. <laughs> and if you have the right attitude, sure, this is a gift. But it really feels initially like your present is just that you get to put yourself through a fucking meat grinder, which uh, they have the right attitude, clearly, because they're doing this. But it's moments like this that really make me sort of stop and be like, yeah, again, I just don't have what it takes, I guess, for certain things. I get my legs chopped off and I wake up and I'm in the kind of pain that would happen if I had actually had my legs chopped off. I'm I'm a pass. That's just me. Call me weak if you like. Fine. But I am just not gonna be like, let me take a breath and do it all over again. Like, nah, man, I am good. Especially because like, what we see from Scorio later does lead me to believe that there is some shit happening to him as a result of all of this. So we will get there. Um, Dan is saying, uh, it's all Chinese genre. I hope I'm saying that right. Cultivation fiction, which, yeah, I didn't realize that that was a thing until after I had read Cradle, that this was like a, a genre of magic, uh, system. But, also, I haven't read anything but like these two and one other that I started and kind of lost interest in, to be honest. And these two are the ones that started with somebody who had no ability using magical objects. The other one didn't kind of follow that trope. Um, but it does not matter. So, so like I said, we get here, they're looking through some stuff, they find the beers and they, on the way, are really, like, kind of taken aback at how similar this place is designed to the place that they are training in now. And how, like, is there a reason why they followed the blueprint so exactly? And Scorio, I think, is the one who says something like, it must have meant something to them. And that could mean either in a sort of, I hesitate to use the word, like, sentimental way, there is that, you know, when you think about like why tradition is respected, let's be honest, a lot of it is about sentiment, even though we try and pretend it's not. Or it could be like, magically speaking, this the way that this place is set up works better. I don't know. But um, I did sort of think that it was, it was fascinating that it is so similar. And even Later on, when Naomi comes, she's also looking around like this place is really bringing back some memories, even though it is not the same place. Um, and they come across some like different things that are indications of having been occupied in a place that people lived, you know, furniture, tapestries that are like scraps hanging on the walls. But eventually they also come across this gigantic spider's web and eventually the gigantic dead spider itself. And the fact that this thing is dead, I love the fact that Leonshi's first question is, okay, so um, <clears throat> what, what was it eating? Because like, maybe we need to worry about that. And also, what killed it? Because that also might be of concern to us, potentially. And I loved that Leonis just says, why don't we just bask in our ignorance until it's something that we're forced to deal with is I, basically the line i don't rem I, i'm i don't have it in front of me but that's essentially what it is and i felt that in my fucking spirit leonis is the one that i'm feeling the closest to just because his overall sense of like sense of humor and need to lighten up the whole vibe definitely feel that but also him at the the point of their parting Looking at Scorio and Leonchi, like, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? Why would you go do this again? What's the matter? There's something wrong with you. Like, you're fucked up. And yes, Leonis, that is why you didn't advance any further. And that's not me throwing shade on you at all. It's me saying you aren't as unbalanced as these other two. For whatever reason... You are somebody who has decided that you're going to actually try and, like, enjoy the moment and your life and pleasures of life and don't want to experience repeated death. 
And I, there, there's nothing about that that's wrong. There isn't any reason to feel like shitty about yourself. I know that you can't help but see as I haven't progressed as far as them, which means that I am weaker than they are. But the only weakness that I feel there is a strength in other senses where you, I feel, are grateful with and satisfied more easily than they are and appreciate things in a way that they don't have any interest in. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's just that it's how you're built, man. You're just built like you are and they're built in the fucked up way they're built. And, you know, what can you do? Um, so then eventually there's this like, there's a, a path that's like, I think in a, uh, mural on the wall, I think. Um, and oh, here it is the path of ascension. It's a mosaic. That's the word I was looking for. Not a mural. Uh, the ranks they ascend through coal, then copper, then iron, bronze, silver, gold. Leon, she says, it's the path, it's the path we all follow. We start as chars, lowest of the low, but then ignite our hearts and become cinders, leaving gold, coal for copper. Then as emberlings, we burn iron, only to move on and become tomb sparks and burn bronze. Flame vaults burn silver. And finally, dread blazes who burn gold. And Scoria's like, okay, and then dread blaze to Pyre Lord? which burns Sapphire, which is where Praxamar is at, and then Blood Baron. And they do, let's see, I think, Leonchi says Blood Baron, few get so far. Above them are the Charnel Dukes, like the White Queen with their ruby mana. So I believe uh, the Blood Barons also burn Sapphire, if I'm not mistaken. Um, And also... Sapphire is like the highest you can get and remain in Bastion because the source is not strong enough here. And then Diamond for Crimson Earls. And the leaves, see those hundreds of grooves? They're empty because Numenon is too precious to waste on a mosaic like this. The final and most potent form of mana found only at the pit of hell itself. Numenon. Is this a real thing? Let me go ahead and look at look this up. Uh, dictionary.com says, in Kantian philosophy, a, th- a thing as it is in itself, as distinct from a thing as it is knowable by the senses through phenomenal attributes. Well, that isn't helpful. <laughs> I don't, I'm, that's not doing anything for me. Um, let's see. In philosophy, uh, is knowledge posited as an object that exists independently of human sense? The term is generally used in contrast with, or in relation to, the term phenomenon, which re- refers to any object of the senses. Immanuel Kant first developed the notion of noumenon as part of his transcendental idealism, suggesting that while we know the noumenal world to exist because human sensibility is merely receptive. It is not itself sensible and must therefore remain otherwise unknowable to us. Oh, that is wild. Okay. Um, it remains the subject of debate among Kant scholars as a result. Well, kids, there you go. I hope that's helpful to you more so than it is to me. I'm I'm getting it. But like, in that way that I feel like if I think about it too much, it's just going to float away. I got to just let it simmer in the background there. Um, and that is uh, Imperators who burn that. Only been six, 76 of them in the whole history of Bastion. So Numenon is basically like, this is a resource that is almost, it's, it's almost like supernatural. Its existence is the vibe I'm getting. It's the sort of thing where my impression would be that you reach a point of such acuity in your senses that you are able to sense beyond 
the regular world. And already our guys are sort of sensing beyond the regular world because they can sense mana at all. But that sounds like it's sort of one step further where that's all mana that while technically it, you are sensing something that the average person can't, it is still of our world. So I'm thinking that maybe is like a crossing a veil sort of thing, but that's just a guess because I learned this word a minute and a half ago. Um, so Scorio says, so from coal to Numenon, why is everyone up to dread blaze merely the roots? And Leon, she says, because supposedly it's only once you ascend to Pyre Lord that your true journey begins. Everything before that is just preparation. And Scorio is like, excuse me? And she's like, yeah, that's what they say. We haven't gotten there yet, so I can't really tell you anymore. But it's, uh, we, got some, we got some work ahead of us, that's all. <laughs> so it's interesting to me that, like, I believe... Leonis said that he had only lived like an average of four years, which the the amount of time it takes to advance. The fact that Leonis like, you know, I was I was talking a lot of shit earlier about how he just is somebody who is more satisfied with just enjoying his life. And I definitely think that's true. But I also we have seen the way that he just throws himself into danger on behalf of his friends. And so the fact that he like doesn't live that long, I would maybe put down to the fact that he values his action more than his life. Right. And that's admirable in its way. So I just think he needs to give himself a little bit of a break. I'm team Leonis and I'm just going to stay there. Um, so then the beers, that's it. Uh, and there are a lot of them that are, completely spotless even though many of them are just covered in debris and dust there are a few that are pristine it says gleaming with mesmerizing allure which i do really like um and they talk about like why that is uh all those which had been damaged or crushed were faded and dilapidated like the rest of the buildings. But those which had miraculously survived the test of time shone as if recently wiped down. What does that mean? asked Leonshi. Perhaps they still collect ambient mana in some way? They approached the archspire, and as they drew closer, Scorio caught sight of the upturned and incurled legs of the web's owner on the far side of the basilica beneath its web. And that's when they're just like, oh, God. Here it is. Leona says, let's revel in our ignorance till we're forced to deal with the answers. So I was pretty close. Um, and Leon, she's just thinking about, like, you know, obviously the number of times that we have lived, we had to have attended this academy, which means that maybe our beers are still around. And she finds one and uh, his Scorio's is like crushed. And I'm thinking, well, that's a shame. But then Leonis is like, oh, well, our lockers are attuned to our souls, but the beers aren't. You could just use any beer. And Scorio's like, oh, well, that's interesting. How do you get back to the gauntlet when you're not dead? And Leona says, why are you asking? You activate the jewel at the base with mana, then lie on it. It's supposed to be simple. Scorio says, why aren't you allowed to visit the gauntlet whenever you want? Because it's an exam. But we've all been told the best way to progress is to fight for our lives. And the gauntlet allows us to simulate that. Why not use it whenever we want? I, you answer him. She shrugged. I don't know. Well, I came here looking for treasures or some iron mana, but if this works. And I thought that that was a pretty interesting question he's asking. Look, everything has been me asking but why did they change this or why can't we remember things, you know? And the fact that you can only do it now and then, I'm almost, so So I, I'm going to just throw this out there. Again, pure conjecture, but what if 
it takes a kind of power to run the gauntlet, like not from the person running it, but like the organization that hosts the gauntlet, for lack of a better way of saying it, the server it's on. What if that just takes so much power that they can't power it up consistently for some reason? And maybe that's why it's not as difficult either. And this one's so much harder because they do this one and they are getting their asses fucking handed to them. It is really grim. And also they're, they're sustaining like some pain afterwards, which they attribute to the, the gauntlets like decay and it being maybe not functional the way that it had, that it would be with the newer one. But a part of me sort of wondered if it's just built so that you have some feeling of consequences after you fail. Um, but yeah, I, I I don't know. It's just interesting. Everything about the way things are set up now feels like the immortal great souls are being purposely limited despite being encouraged to advance. It feels like they're telling them this, but not actually wanting them to advance. Like there's something it's very American dreamy where it's like anybody can get there, but then they do fucking everything they can to keep you from actually getting there because really the system wouldn't work if anybody could do it. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, but there's just a whole suspicion here. And I keep thinking about like whether this area actually was destroyed on purpose and they had to build a new school to maintain whatever like deceit it is that they're engaged in because I'm just assuming everybody is full of shit, but they may not be. I'm assuming people remember and they're keeping it from others. Maybe nobody remembers. Maybe somebody made sure nobody remembered anything. I don't know. Anyway. So of course, Scorio is going to jump in there and Leonshi is like me where she's, just listing off the many, many reasons why this is a bad idea. You don't know if you'll come back here. You don't know if you'll come back at all. You don't even know, like, for sure that the gauntlet is, like, running. What if you go in there and there's not a way to get out? Like, there's a billion things that could go wrong. And Scorio is like, look, that's all true. I respect that you are bringing these points up. But the thing is, I could either do this or... Or I can just keep doing the paltry shit I've been doing. And I'd rather die. So let me just try this. And uh, that's hardcore. So he goes through. And it is very similar to the gauntlet that he has run before. But it's just not quite the same. Uh, So it's a tomb of hammered copper. Let me just real quick, because I know that the first word of the book is like Scorio awoke in a tomb of blank. So let me just back up real quick and see what that is. Uh, Scorio awoke from death in a tomb of hammered copper. Okay, there it is. A faint blood orange glow seeping into the air from a rectangular hole in the ceiling. Blood orange glow. Okay, you heard that here first, kids. This space was lit by a pale golden light that seeped in from the rectangular hole in the ceiling above. Hell is in charge. Right? That's just what it's got to be. Hell won. And you're down there now. And you just think you're not. You think you're fighting hell. But it's all over. It just doesn't make any sense otherwise. Like, what about the sky that was cloudy? That he saw through, like, the the little gap? They're in hell. And I mean, she said that before. Leon, she has straight up said, like, we live in hell. But I mean, it seems like they are in the pit of hell. I... Does that make sense? Nah. But also... It makes as much sense as anything so far. We don't have information for anything to make sense. <gasps> okay. So 
No platform arose before him. No broad steps led up to it. Instead, a searing white column burned in the distance, accessible through a gap between three rows of successive iron walls, whose tops disappeared into the gloom, each gap narrower than the last. Fifty men might walk through first, thirty through the second, perhaps only ten through the last. The ground was greatly changed as well. Gone was the beaten copper, and in its place, Scorio saw uneven stone akin to a cavern's floor. This rose and fell like frozen waves of some storm-tossed sea, growing rougher as one drew close to the walls so that the last great serried ridges jutted across the gaps, creating a tortured path toward the white beam that wound back and forth as it navigated around them. So he's just looking around here and he's noting that this place also has this strange vibe of things like falling apart and there being a sense of it decaying, but there's still such power here, you know? Um, so he's a little bit for a moment shook at the fact that he's in this and there's nobody with him. Last time he was in a gauntlet, he had his friends and he will again soon, but he goes through this and I'm not going to like describe every step of the way, but suffice to say, he's expecting a lot of things based on what he went through the first time that aren't happening. He's the, the, first uh, attack, the first trial, I suppose, turns out to be very, very different. It's blades that are swinging toward him instead of like the one bolt that comes at them. Um, I can't remember if it's specifically a crossbow bolt, but regardless, he's like kind of ready to deal with something that's on the same level of difficulty. And a second blade slid between his ribs and right out through his back. Scorio's eyes bulged as he gripped the naked blade with one hand, only to scream as a third weapon swept right through his shins, hewing them cleanly off below the knees. Ugh, when they say life comes at you fast, that shit, I was barely able to like keep up mentally with how quickly this man just gets cut into pieces. The last thing he says is, damn. And I was like, if this is hell, that's extra funny. And he wakes up and he is in pain. And it, eventually he figures out that cycling mana really, really helps with the pain. But initially he is having sort of almost like a panic attack response, you know, understandably. And Leonshi has to talk him through breathing through it so that he is able to calm down because he's like hyperventilating. Um, and he finally explains to them all about like this being, you know, the same idea, but way more difficult and different. And is, it comes to the conclusion, this is the perfect training resource. If training, if the best training is the most lethal, it won't get better than this. But the pain, said Leonis, tone sober, it lasted. This isn't the same. It's not, but pain I can handle as long as it's not permanent. I'm not saying it'll be enjoyable, but this is effectively our own private gauntlet. We can run it as many times as we've got the resolve. Can you imagine what that will do for our training? His friends stared at him, and then Leonshi gave a curt nod. He's right. Leonis turned to stare at her. And Leonis goes along with this because he feels an obligation to have their backs. But this is not like... I believe if Leonshi weren't here, that Leonis would probably have just like argued with and eventually gripped up Scorio to keep him from trying to do this again. He is... You know, it's two to one and they're going to go whether he wants them to or not. But I feel like just because he's outnumbered and just because he feels like a sense of duty that he's going to go with them. And it's just clear, like, 
he isn't feeling what they're feeling in terms of the need to move forward. Um, so Scorio explains to them the way the blades moved so that they can sort of plan out how they're going to handle this. They go in and have the same reaction of just like, God, this is so similar, but it's really different. Um, and <laughs> I love Leonis. Make room, Leonis, the golden king's going in. Prepare yourself, O gauntlet, and tremble. And with a great wordless cry of defiance, he ran right at the blade of light and dove into it. So they do their thing in this blade room and they manage to get through. And the next door is this strange sort of uh, like it's it's a stream going down the center, a river of shadow. Uh, and there are these s strange very dissimilar statues on either side and it's really clear like these bitches are going to move when you move when just like that um and let's see Leonshi says if my theory holds then three of them should animate when triggered triggered how walking down the center what if we squeeze in behind them I doubt it would be so easy to evade the room's challenge. What if we attack the closest statue before it animates? What if that causes all of them to animate? I think we have to make our way slowly to the far side and be ready to react when they come to life. Leona scowled. What if we sprint to the far side? That way we won't be surrounded and can put the wall to our backs. Sure, said Scorio. That works for me, Leonshi. And it just made me think of like, you know, the blades that kind of come out of the walls in the gauntlet that they originally went through and how there's that path down the middle that's very tempting to just walk down that but the best way is to stay to one side because then the blades are only coming at you from one direction instead of both sides and it's like a similar kind of idea but just implemented very differently so that you can sense a little bit like I, I'm sure this has to be on purpose. The inspiration for the new gauntlet and its design, even though it's really not the same. Um, so anyway, uh, it, it says they took off at a sprint. The balls of Scorio's feet barely touched the ground as he ran. And a moment later, they collided with the far wall, hands outstretched to arrest their impacts. He turned, chest working powerfully, and for a moment thought nothing was going to happen. Then three of the statues began to move carefully and precisely, and they come down and just go at them, but in very different fighting styles, which is really kind of fun. Um, the first was a young woman in ragged robes, a single pauldron over her left shoulder, a curved stabbing blade in one hand. The second was a large man, nearly as big as Leonis, heavily bearded and clasping a large battle axe with both fists. The third was an archer, though the short bow lacked a string. The man was slender, cloaked, but without a hood. Heavy tresses hung down to his shoulders, and his beard was close shaved. And I'm really curious, like, if these are actual people that they are based on or if this is you know like just where where are these are they just archetypes like i don't know um so scorio says eyes on the archer because he wants to like handle one at a time basically um and then three of us on the axe man watch out for the woman she'll attack our rear lol and Eventually, they <laughs> they manage to, like, handle this axe man. It cracks into the ground. Leonis was there, charging with a roar, one shoulder lowered to barrel into the other large man. Just before he connected, however, an arrow appeared above his clavicle, sinking deep. Then Leonis smashed into the axe man with a cry, only to bounce off as if he'd collided with a column. The Axeman staggered back off balance. So it's not that it had no effect, but it's just they're not people. It's not going to work like that, you know. Um, and 
it says Lianchi flew in, leaping in to hammer a sidekick into the statue's chest. The impact of her sandal accompanied by a sharp crack, and then the statue toppled over backward. And I was like, so wait, did he, <laughs> did Leonis like warm it up? Did he get that statue damaged enough that she was able to break it with a kick? Like, or is it her kick that much stronger than Leonis tackle? How is that possible? Um, Scoria fell upon the archer and it was like crashing down onto a pile of sharp edged rocks. So then he hears something getting close with long weapons. Stay far away from short ones. The voice was gruff, unfamiliar, but it sounded like something he'd heard in another life. Scorio checked his charge, remaining just out of stabbing range, and circled. And I don't, I think that's meant to have been kind of coming from the figure that he's fighting with, the archer. But I don't know if it's like in his head or if it's, are they hearing it? It doesn't seem like it. And as far as I recall, I don't remember it getting mentioned again. Any like particular verbal message like that. Um, anyway, so, uh, Scorio gets distracted because he hears Leonchi scream. He turns and like looks for her. He doesn't see Leonis at all. And then it says his statue slid forward deceptively quickly and stabbed at Scorio's gut, forcing him to leap back. And it's pushing him and pushing him backward. And, uh, is clutching the knife arm with both hands, Scorio brought it down as hard as he could upon his knee. And the statue shivered, took a jerky step back, then fragmented. Scorio saw movement out of the corner of his eye, tried to leap away, but a slender knife slipped into his chest through thick muscle and between the ribs, plunging right into his heart with surgical precision. The assassin had crept up right beside him. Her long blade dripped with blood, which was also generously splashed across her robes. And as he staggered away, hand clasping the deeply embedded knife, he saw her lips curl into the subtlest of smiles, which is so embarrassing. She was right there and he didn't even notice because he was so distracted. They all have their little, you know, she's just got a really high stealth rating, I guess. So they wake up. And they're all in pain. This is when he figures out like the cycling and how that works. But they are definitely having a bit of a difficult time getting past feeling this pain the way they're feeling it. And um, I do appreciate that Scorio is trying to hype them all up. And Leanne, she's like, look, I get what you're doing and it's working. But also give me a second to just feel like shit. Can you just hold on? <laughs> and I really, I appreciated that because sometimes people act as if like, if you just power through and don't let yourself get caught up in the emotion and it's like, nah, usually you need to let yourself feel that emotion and just sit there with it for a second and then it'll move on on its own, but you can't like make that happen. Um, so anyway, this, this is so like, this is the second room and they got all the way to the other end of it, which surprised me because I thought that the sprint wasn't really going to work. I kind of thought that was going to awaken everything. So the fact that it doesn't was like feeling like they were ahead of the game. And then it turned out to just be irrelevant. It's like, you may as well just have to fight your way across for all the good it does you to get to the other side in the beginning. Um, and they agreed to go back in with him. And uh, I love that, Leonchi is like, I feel like I must be a masochist, but I'm kind of stoked to get back in there again. And Leonis says, I think that all great souls probably are masochists. So yeah. So chapter 33, it was second rust when they finally called it quits. His heart refused to settle. His body felt uncomfortably cold and a strange sense of vertigo kept seizing him whenever he raised his eyes to the heights of the basilica. Stomach churning, throat parched, he forced himself to stand upright, willing himself not to sway. Can I just 
day dead, asked Leonis. And he is all sweaty. He's pale. And it even says his eyes are sunken. It's taking a toll. And later on, Scorio is just trying to pretend it's not. And bro, you can't do that. I know that like in this world, you can do that more than in ours. So maybe he can be forgiven for thinking that he can just keep pushing it. He has done all kinds of shit that's low key supposed to kill you and he has made it. So I can really understand how you start to get to a place where you just don't think anything's going to kill you. But I don't know, guy, there's just something about this that it doesn't feel for me like I'm just I'm just totally guessing here and I know it doesn't really match up with what we're being told. What we're being told is that there is a sense of decay to this place that it is breaking down and later on he and Naomi are talking about it and she suggests there may be a point where it's non-functional enough that you come back with your injuries or not completely healed at the very least. And perhaps, but I just kind of like the idea that even when functionally perfect, this left you with more consequences than the other gauntlet did. And maybe that's why the gauntlet that they currently are put through, they can't just do over and over again. Maybe it does actually fuck with you in some way that they found to be too severe and they were like how about we don't let just people do this over and over also you guys remember me saying scorio has this like low-key villain sort of series of titles and he just doesn't seem like the type even though he's got a an a rage problem but i couldn't figure out like how did how does he become somebody that is that you know, something changed him and it could be this. It could be something like this. Like we have a really tense conversation here. So he leads his friends back because they had come so close that they go back in one last time to face the gauntlet, even though it's getting late and they probably should have wrapped, but they really, really thought we were so close last time. We're going to get it this time. And they don't. This is very giving video game, like high key. And then he leads them back to like a point where they can stop and take their own way home. And Leon, she says, promise me you won't do the gauntlet without us. What? Scorio flushed. And gave an involuntary laugh. What makes you think I do that? Leonchi set her jaw. Scorio. And I really liked the, the involuntary laugh. And it could be read as, what makes you think I do that? Like, he's defensive because he was already planning to turn around and go back to it. But when she is like, what were you planning on? He says, I hadn't even thought that far, which I actually believed. I really thought he was telling the truth and that him saying, what makes you think I'd do that? Was sort of a reflexive like, well, that sounds crazy. And also I'm buying time because it sounds crazy, but isn't terrible. And there's a point when Leonis says, you would probably camp there if we didn't say anything and Scorio goes, camp there. And Leonis is like, Jesus, dude, no, absolutely not. And I was laughing because I fully thought once this started to like come in, before I really understood the level of the toll it took after the fifth time through, I really was thinking Scorio was just going to move in here. I straight up thought. And it wasn't until they begin to have this conversation that I was sort of like, oh, yeah, I was assuming he would go back through without them also. And it, it, it even though they were suffering ill effects, 
my interpretation initially was that these effects were uh, just exaggerated training fatigue, not that there was something even greater at work here. And when Leonis says, like, you know, this is not just, the, Leonis says this is not regular training. You shouldn't do this alone. And Leonis says, dying over and over again isn't something you can just brush off. It takes a toll. I've just done it five times and I feel awful. I know you. You'll go back there every day. And it really made me curious, like, what they're feeling is different than how I was seeing it until they use these words to describe it, you know? Um <laughs> I do. I I wanted to mention this line too. Uh, that was a little bit earlier when they first wake up, and Leonis is like complaining, you know, the way that he does. He says, "Don't listen to me. I just hate being brutally murdered repeatedly by emotionless statues." And honestly, it could have ended earlier, and I think it would have been even funny. I just hate being brutally murdered repeatedly. <laughs> I just thought that was really funny. And the delivery, this audiobook narrator is quite good. I actually am like growing to be like, oh, maybe I'll look into other stuff that you've narrated because he's doing a really good job with the line delivery. There is nothing more frustrating for me than a narrator that reads jokes that obviously were meant to be read in a certain cadence and they don't do that. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like somebody reading a play and they're just not seeing that the, this line was meant to be a joke. They're not predicting that the mood that a character is in and there have been a couple like audiobooks that there have been joke lines read that I didn't get were meant to be jokes until I actually saw them on the page later on and it just makes me really happy whenever I come across a narrator who is able to really nail line delivery from different characters in a row who are all coming from very different places because that's kind of tricky to like mentally keep track of um, so this conversation is a lot more peppery than I was thinking it would be. Scorio is resentful. And when I was talking earlier about what could turn him into a villain, this also occurred to me and it didn't enter my mind the last time I asked this question, because I said, he seems like somebody who cares about things being fair and has a sense of right and wrong. And it wasn't until this interaction that all of a sudden I was like, well, people can go bad because they have a really strong sense of right and wrong, actually. Like, feeling that kind of thing acutely can f fuel rage like nothing else, actually. And as somebody who deals with her own rage issues, and a lot of it comes from this feeling of things are just unfair for no good reason, except that some people are pieces of shit. It's very, very difficult sometimes for me to let go of it because it's never going to change. And, and when I say that, I don't mean like systems can't change. Everything can, but like there will never be a point where the world is perfectly fair. It's just very likely never going to happen. And so I have to keep that in mind, but also I have to be doing something and it can feel so frustrating and make you feel so helpless that this moment here where he's talking with them about like the resentment of not getting the resources they have and he's not holding it against them personally but in this moment they're the ones telling him not to do this alone and he really feels that they don't get it which they don't of course they don't and he thinks later maybe i should have shown them where i fucking sleep every night so that they could really see the situation that i'm in because i don't feel like they fully appreciate how little i have to work with and the fact that i'm where i'm at is insane actually um, so, you know, he just says, what should I do? Will you both benefit from the Academy's largesse? Sit and manipulate coal mana? I, I need to use what options I have. I don't get to be selective. 
now you mention it, why shouldn't I? What's the worst thing that can happen to me? I already live in the ruins. It's not like crossing them is going to get any worse. And if I enter the gauntlet, sure, I'll die. But it's the best way to apply tension. Why shouldn't I make use of it? And this is when Leona says, dying repeatedly does something to you. You'll die repeatedly until there's no scorio left. We're not trying to hold you back. We want you to progress just like we're doing, but not at the expense of your sanity. Scorio met Leona's gaze squarely. I understand what you're saying. I appreciate your concern, but I won't make an oath I don't intend to keep. So he really either doesn't believe that the threat to his sanity is genuine or his sanity is worth less to him than the power, which is a problem. You don't want to be in that headspace in general. That's not great, Scorio. And you really need to step back and think about the fact that you're in that headspace because that's not feeling like, what good are you doing anybody? You don't even have a particular need for this power that you can pinpoint. And when Leonshi says, I understand, I'd probably do the same thing. Leonis just yells at her, why? And she can't answer him. I feel the same drive, but if someone told me I'd gain power by stabbing myself in the leg over and over, I wouldn't do it while I really think both of you would. Because I have to think on it, but I will. I'll find an answer for you. Fine. I appreciate the honesty and you, Scorio. He stepped back in close and grasped Scorio by the nape of his neck. Scorio tensed. But when Leonis pressed his brow to his own, he realized that he wasn't about to be attacked. I don't know if that's just meant to be a general reaction to, like, the way he's coming at him. But it felt almost like he's starting to grow suspicious of his friends potentially trying to attack him. Is that that feels like not normal either? You know, I don't know. Um. So Leonis just says, take care of yourself. And when we come back, you better, he says, I best see you waiting for us with a basket of delight of heaven buns. And I was like, where's the money? You want him to have a basket of these? Where's the money though? Give it to him. Now, I just keep being very aware of this. And Leonis is a generous guy. So I was sort of thinking that was going to be the next natural thing, but no. So... They leave and Scorio has a moment here of deep, deep rage. And I love how this is described. Uh, He should get back to his chamber and eat and drink and rest. But instead, he found himself imagining his friends walking back through the disparate wards, making their way into the academy and then into their rooms. Perhaps they'd bathe in their private pool first, floating and discussing the day's events. Then they'd call for food or go to some dining hall where heaping piles of delicacies and elixirs would be given to them, restoring their strength, their vitality, clean robes, clean quarters, the finest that Bastion could provide. Scorio felt the skin around his eyes grow strangely tight, and he began to pace. It wasn't their fault. He was genuinely happy for them. He wanted them to get the best there was after their brutal day with him, but it galled him that they'd given him restrictions on what he could do. Um, I want to mention just briefly here as an aside. I brought up when I was covering Mage Aaron that author's tendency to reuse the same few words often to the point that it became really distracting. It would be we, even within one sentence that he would use the same word twice to describe something. That has been almost a non-issue except for the word brutal in this book. This man uses the word brutal so often that and in ways that at first I thought was were interesting because I was sort of like I've never seen a bridge called brutal before and it's meant to just describe that it's like a really stark kind of architecture with no embellishment or anything um but he starts to use it 
more and more. And I'm just going to search and see in this book how many times the word is used. 37 times in the book. Uh, we've got once in chapter 11, three times in 15. Um, then one time per chapter until chapter 33, which makes sense that I'm saying this now because I just read this chapter. 33 he uses the word brutal six times in that one chapter alone. Endless brutal death. I just hate being brutally murdered. Uh, they're talking about their brutal day with him. A brutal uppercut at waist height. A bridge loomed before him, brutal and broad. Scorio studied the brutal lower half of the arch spire. So, yeah, that's... Uh, you're going to need to start to put a little bit of a uh, stop to that, sir. Just chill out. I feel like your use of it at first I was sort of into, but just find something else. That's a lot. Um, so yeah, it's just clearly his favorite word. And it's a, I, I, I do like that word, but you know, just have to point it out. That's my job. So this is when he begins to really spiral a little bit about his situation. The fact that you know, he has been doing his best and I have to give it to him that one could call this simply self-pity, but I really dislike boiling something this complex down to simple self-pity because that sounds so dismissive and like somebody is being a real baby and a brat. The situation that Scorio is in is truly unfair, unjust, and awful. And the, the circumstances that he has been living in, he has refused to let them get him down and is doing his best, always attempting to like take it one step further than anybody would reasonably expect to do what he needs to do. And I think he has earned this moment of profound self-pity. It's a shame that it begins to turn into anger towards other people the way that it has. But it's also really understandable when you have been trying almost to ignore your circumstances. Like it's that's too strong a word, but he has been trying to almost like be like, they're not going to hold me back at all. That's just not how it works. It will. And you're starting to see that no matter how much you may want and how willing you are to put yourself into situations to get it, you're still going to be limited. It's not enough. And that fucking sucks to realize. So he fucking uh, beats the shit out of the walls here while thinking about that Naomi doesn't even want to like show him where she lives. She doesn't trust him at all. She is joking about how he'll probably be dead soon. And there's just a real like, she clearly doesn't give a fuck. And I found it interesting that as he begins to beat the shit out of this wall, she suddenly shows up and actually, no, I'm lying. He stops and he begins to walk back toward the academy, the abandoned academy. And that's when she shows up and she's like, so where are you heading? And he gets real pissy and is just like, the fuck do you care, basically? Leave something behind? My training. And she's like, yeah, um, you're supposed to train when you're like clear headed and you aren't. Look at you. You're a fucking disaster right now. And he's like, who cares? I'm guaranteed to lose, but that's the point. And she immediately is like, what do you mean? Guaranteed to die. And he tells her, and insists on going back, even though she keeps being like, you really shouldn't. And this is what he says. Why is everyone trying to tell me what to do? Naomi's smile enraged him further. Because there's a small handful of people in this world that don't want to watch you throw your life away. And the, the eventual point they come to is, fine, if you're going to go, I'll come with you. This, the the walk there it needs to a point where Scorio is like clearly kind of feeling abashed 
that he lashed out the way he did. And I think it feels a bit guilty at the things he was thinking about her not giving a shit when here she is only going with him, like only letting him go if she can go with him, which does indicate that she has grown to give a shit about what happens to him, despite him thinking otherwise. Um, and he's trying to explain to her what it is they're going to be facing and is really frustrated that she doesn't seem to be hearing him or giving anything that he is warning her about due gravity. But then when they go in, she proves why she wasn't really very worried about the stuff that he was telling her. Um, so let's see. Uh, the darkness was so thick, he was forced to use his dark vision constantly. He led them to the Orient Hall. And this is when she says that this takes me back. Um, and she comes up, here it is. Uh, Naomi moved past the beers to stop at last before the ancient arch spire. She reached out to touch its base with a thoughtful air, then drew her hand back rapidly. What? There's a strong mana current running through it, she said. There is? But it's broken. Broken, but not dead. And not just coal mana, either. I sense... Suffice to say, it was powerful and beyond my ability to parse. What does it mean? I don't know. Can we harvest that mana somehow? To which she just turned to stare at him, eyebrow raised. What? We're on a quest to get better than coal, right? And if this is mana going to waste, you're welcome to try, she said dryly. But while I can sense it, it's protected, sheathed within the archbire proper. You sure you want to go back in there? And they go in. She just absolutely dodges, ducks, cuts down. It's so shocking to him that he thought he knew how far ahead of him she actually was. And it's really obvious. Like, I, I feel like this doesn't really get said, but it's something that would be kind of on my mind. You know, she's been training him and in training, it's been a lot of fighting. And he has been under the impression that he has almost been able to beat her a couple of times. And I'm thinking that there has been a real shift in his understanding there where he realizes she has been holding back a whole lot. And there is just no way to not feel a little bit embarrassed when you realize that you thought you were like, catching up to a person and then you find out they've just actually been dumbing everything down for your ass because you are so far behind. And like I said, that's not exactly said in so many words, but I just kept thinking about it. Um, <laughs> slicing through the statue's neck, like a knife through a cream pie, which is a great imagery. I loved that. I was just like, that's way better than a hot knife through butter, a knife through a cream pie. Like, I don't know. I just really enjoyed that. Um, so, yeah, this a white cube flew out from the wall to the left, leaving a hollow where it had been embedded, coming at them at knee height. The nightmare lady's tail cracked out, slicing it in half because, yeah, she turns into her nightmare form and he stops calling her Naomi. Once they're doing this, it's clear like she is her other self at the moment. And she keeps on defending him, watching out for him, but also emphasizes that my skill set with fighting is like close range. So if you want to be okay, you better stay right next to me or else you, I can't tell you if you're going to be all right or not. Um, and they go through, I think, how many rooms? They go through six? Uh, I'm trying to find, because I don't want to go through every single one of these rooms, but there's another one where it's like the, the walls are moving. And this reminded me of the room that Scoria ultimately wound up dead. And just, again, a more challenging version of it. Um, as soon as he thinks like, oh, this isn't so bad, it starts to get bonkers. And she just keeps rescuing him, basically. 
Um, the monster had to stand some nine feet tall. Nightmare Lady broke into a run, sprinting across the shadowed hall right at it. The ogre lowed its blade into a defensive stance. She slid aside, passed by his attack, stabbed her tail into the hollow beneath its lantern jaw, and then she was past the throne. Tail following sinuously after her, its tip gleaming wetly as the sword fell from the ogre's huge hands. And it just falls down, and she's like, come on, hurry up. And Scorio was like, what the fuck? Um, okay, so fifth room, end of char level. This is a cinder run. The next room will be a whole level harder. Um, and I think this is the room where there are blades. Yes. And the blades, like, it's going to be very tricky to walk through them anyway, but then they begin to move and the ground begins to pull them in a certain direction. And all of this, like, added together is uh, even more challenging than she was prepared for, clearly. Um, <clears throat> And she is asking him to stay basically pressed against the back of her body because otherwise it, it, everything is so close. And uh, he winds up getting sliced up. His death was mercifully swift. And that is the end of chapter 34. This just, again, I can't imagine going through this the number of times that he had an actual death and that pain when you wake up. But there is something really fun about getting a preview of what the other rooms are going to be like. He's just basically watching somebody speed run ahead of him at first. And so they only get through the uh, four rooms and they get stopped at the fifth room. But the, the, so th as far ahead as he gets to see, it's not that much farther ahead, but considering how much they get stuck in a particular room, I could see it being enough that he doesn't get through this with his friends for a while yet. So it's not that many in terms of number, but in terms of the amount of time that they'll have to dedicate to each room, it could be a significant amount. But maybe getting a preview helps to keep that from being as much of an obstacle. It seems like mostly, though, it's it's her sheer ability, not necessarily only knowing what's coming, but deftness of movement, awareness, speed, things that you can't just control, you know, you have to train for. So I guess we'll see. Oh, my God, I'm so over time. You guys, I didn't even realize Ugh, all right, I got to wrap up. Thank you guys again so much for hanging out with me. Thank you, Dan, for commissioning this. Appreciate you a lot. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.